Uh, I'm going to ask you tonight if you take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Uh, this particular chapter is going to be the theme verse. Uh, is going to be found in this chapter uh, in the meeting in St. Lucia in November. Uh, verse 9 uh, is, is actually going to be that verse where the Bible says, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And I'm in the process right now of, of, uh, of studying and working towards that meeting and uh, my part of that. Uh, but uh, uh, I was drawn to a, um, a particular passage in this chapter. As I've observed, uh, I was taught to observe. Uh, my dad had a philosophy about something, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's done well for me in the, in the physical world. He said, you watch people do things. You learn how to do it. Then you don't have to pay them to do it. And a lot of what I know and have the ability to do is from that very thing. I observed people that knew how to do it and watched them. And uh, uh, But the problem now is that as I've gotten older, I'm getting less physically able to do those things I used to be able to do. Uh, and now I'm having to pay somebody sometimes. But to learn by observation, and, and I've tried to observe since I've been here, and uh, I think this verse tonight is really uh, a commendation of what I've observed, but also a challenge to make sure that it's contagious. Right? First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 16, look at verse 13 if you would. The Bible says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, Quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to every one that helpeth with us and laboreth. Let me point out something tonight that I think is an important thing to, to begin this message with, and that's this. There are so many reasons why we use the King James Bible. I just want to mention one. All right, just one. What it meant is what it still means. When you find a word in the Bible, in this King James Bible, you need to find out how that word was defined when this Bible came into being. Because if you don't do that, you can, ex you can look into the Word of God and see a word, and you know the definition now, and it's not right. And so when we have all these modern translations... They've taken things and they've added something there in their own definitions of words, and it changes it. Right, right. Uh, as was mentioned this morning, you know, uh, th uh, you, you change to be what to do what's right, but things that are not the same are not the same. Right. Amen. Yeah. And we we look at things that, and one of those words is found here in verse fifteen. It's the word addicted. Uh, when I was growing up, my, uh, uh, my mom worked for a grocery store chain, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to see a show of hands. How many people remember green stamps? Nobody under 50, probably. <laughs> All right, you, got, you would get green stamps when you'd go to the grocery store, some grocery store. And you could collect those, and then you could get things with them. Well, my mom, who worked at this grocery store, uh, she got a unabridged Webster's Dictionary. And an unabridged Webster's Dictionary is about this thick. It has all kinds of different types of, of words in there. And, thing. and so she, I, we had that at our house. And you would get it in sections and then we would put it together. And I, ha I had a copy of that uh, up in not too long ago. And I would look up definitions in that dictionary 
from 1955, year I was born. In 1955, words meant something different then than they do now. The word hasn't changed, the definition has. You could look up, for example, the word, and, and it was mentioned this morning, you could look up the word homosexual in the 1955 dictionary, and one of the words that it would use was perversion. You look up a modern dictionary and look at what it said. It says it's an alternative. Now, same word, but somehow or another the definition has been changed. All right. So when you look at the word addicted here, the first thing crosses your mind is not positive. It's automatically negative. We talk about someone who is an addict. And it, I understand that it can carry with it a, a negative connotation, but not here. We need to understand, it's very interesting what this word means in this passage. Addiction. The modern dictionary defines it this way. It's the state of being compulsively committed to a habit or practice or to something that is psychologically or physically habit-forming as narcotics to such an extent that its cessation causes severe trauma. In other words, if you're an addict and you're trying to not be an addict, it's a hard thing to do. It's hard to overcome that. It's, it, every bit about that definition is negative. All right, now listen to this. Uh, I have a Webster's 1828 Dictionary. If you don't have one, you ought to get one. It's helpful, very helpful. This is the definition in that dictionary. Addiction means the act of devoting yourself Amen. to a practice, the state of being devoted. Amen. That doesn't even sound like the same word. Yeah. It's because it's really not the way it's defined today compared to the way it's defined in the Bible. To be addicted. It also is defined as something to you arrange things in an orderly manner so that a task that you are devoted to can be carried out. An orderly fashion, being addicted. One negative, one definition, one positive, the Bible definition. So, it tells us in verse 15 that ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They are devoted to the point where they put things in their life in order that they might be able to carry out the task of the ministry. We need to be ministry addicts. We need to be devoted to it. To the point where we literally take our lives and line it up to be able to do that. The house of Stephanus was devoted to the cause of Christ. So much so that the Bible has chosen to use them as an example to us now. That's why it's recorded. So that we can see that. The house of Stephanus, they were, uh, they were addicted to the ministry. And it's like they had this testimony that that's the way they were in those days. Wouldn't it be great? if that was the testimony of our individual lives that we were addicted to the ministry that uh, as a church that we were addicted to the ministry well that's what the Bible wants that's what God wants that's why it, it's, it's worded the way it is the biblical addiction can be described by a lot of things it's devotion and dedication and commitment and that's not a real popular word these days uh, but it's a part of addiction. Biblical addiction. Commitment. It's a zeal. We dealt with this subject in, in, uh, in Grand Cayman. Uh, the idea of that if you're not operating from a burden, 
you can be easily detoured. It's not hard to get you off track if you don't have a burden. If you have a burden for the ministry, you know what you'll be? Addicted. But you need to operate from a burden. There needs to be a zeal in that burden. Uh, another thing is the love of Christ constraineth us, the Bible says. Uh, we have a servant's heart. If we have a servant's heart, we're addicted to the ministry. If we're willing to give of ourselves for a cause, if we're determined, if we're not easily detoured or distracted, if we're not double-minded, which means we would be unstable if we are. The Bible says so. Uh, we'd be steadfast and sure. We would be unwavering. You look at a lot of things, and what the brother preached this morning, was, by the way, was a great message, and the idea that what we're seeing in our day that's calling itself something is a redefining of the term. That's not church. It's not, it's not even Christianity. It's some form of godliness. That's the way the Bible describes it. But it denies the power thereof. So, uh, it's, it's uh, this idea of being addicted. It's not fickle or unreliable or occasional, but it's faithful and it's consistent. I'm going to give you a couple of Bible examples of this at the end of the message, but uh, just to illustrate the point. But someone that has a, a biblical addiction will not be hard to find. Now, what you think about that? Uh, you'll find them at church Amen. when the doors are open. Yeah. Now, I don't want to be there. Why? Because I'm addicted. Amen. I'm addicted to the ministry. You'll find them present when a need arises yep. so that they can help to attend to that need. They're Amen. addicted to the ministry. You'll find them with their nose and their head and their heart in the book Amen. when they're addicted. You'll also find them on their knees in reliant prayer before God. I know those that may not, not agree with what I'm saying as far as the definition is concerned, but I'm okay with being an addict. I want to be God's addict. If you hang around... What you'll find, you'll find addicts behind the scenes doing things that nobody else wants to do. And then when somebody comes and sees that it's done, they say, well, I wonder how that happened. Well, maybe it was an addict that was addicted to the ministry, that knew that that was something that needed to be done. They were not looking for any glory. They're looking to do what needs to be done. If you didn't actually see them do it, you might wonder how all that happened. But they're at, they're at the attic part of their life. That They're doing what needs to be done. You'll, you'll find them being a blessing and not desiring any credit. They want the glory to rightfully go to God. Huh you'll not have to wonder where they are. They'll be right there Amen. serving God sure. with their whole heart. Amen. That's an addict. And the house of Stephanus had that testimony. I'm going to use that term. I, I, I'll give you a modern term for that. The house of Stephanus had that kind of reputation. But the Bible uses the term testimony. They had that kind of testimony. And it was so obvious because they actually stood out from a lot of other groups and a lot of other people and a lot of other individuals. There's a lot of uh, uh, peripheral things that happen in, in a ministry where people only, you know, they go so far and that's as far as they go. They're a part of it, but they're really not in it. The pastor preached not long ago about being in, in, in. You know, they, you know you, you, you're in. When you're in, you're an addict. You're addicted to it. You, you, you want your life to be a r surrounding about that. I've lived long enough to remember when the church was the center of the community rather than just being something that was stuck there. Because there was, a, there was an addiction to it around it. Uh, 
they'll be there. I make this statement using the biblical definition. There's a great need for spiritual, biblical addicts for the cause of Christ. Amen. And that needs to be you. If you're saved, that needs to be you. Amen. Uh, when, when we moved up here and moved up here and moved up here, for those of you that didn't laugh, we brought three U-Haul trucks up here. Brother well, Eddie drove a 26-footer to begin with, and then we thought a 20-footer was big enough. And so the day that we loaded up the 20-footer, we parked it on the street, and I got another 15-footer. I drove that one. He drove the 20. My wife drove the car. Here we are. Sometime before long, we're going to have the biggest yard sale in the history of Kentucky. <laughs> but this is what happened in that move. Now listen to this very simple illustration. I could have loaded that truck by myself. It would have killed me, but I could have done it. But then when one person helped, and another person helped, and another person helped. There was a need, and when the need was met by those that joined together in Virginia and in Kentucky, it made the work lighter, quicker, more efficient. But if there's no addiction... You don't get any help. If there's no desire to help, if there's no devotion to that, then it just makes it harder on everybody. So the house of Stephanus being addicted to the ministry had been a blessing to the church. And it was working so well. And, and, and what the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of God, is telling these folks, you need to have this same addiction. How, how, how great it would be at the church at Corinth if everybody was like the house of Stephanus. What a great testimony to have. What great glory there was to God in that testimony of being addicted. Our desire should be to have that addictive testimony in this world. I wonder if that's actually being said, by the way. You know that church over there in Kentucky, in Florence? They're addicted to the ministry. Amen. And that can be noised abroad, you know. Oh, there's, there's a whole lot of people that know about this church that don't live around here. And what's going on. And how it's reached out. There are, there are a lot of different examples. I'm, I'm going to give you two. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14. I'm going to give you biblical examples of this. 1 Samuel chapter 14. One of my favorite passages of Scripture. There's such a great story here. Not, not long ago, uh, on uh, Wednesday night at our church in, in Danville, uh, where I was pastoring, I went through the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, I mean literally verse by verse, and we did it a long time. Okay? Uh, I might not be long-winded each time, but over time I'm long-winded. And, and, and I, I tried to put together notes for the folks and whatnot, and it ended up being some 300 pages when it was all done. All right? But it's just, it's, just a great, it's just a great chapter. And, and you can read 1 Samuel like this. This is a, a, a book of stories real life stories, things that really happen, that have such great lessons behind every story. This is one of those, and again, one of my favorites. First Samuel chapter 14, look at verse 1. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bear his armor. And you'll notice as we read this, the armor bearer is not named. Now if you have to have name recognition... You're not addicted. 
But the arm, it said, and his arm were bare. They come and let us, he said, come let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, and Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people knew uh, not that Jonathan was gone. He didn't tell anybody. He said, there's just something needs to be done. Here's something just to notice. In verse 1, now it came to pass upon a day. What would it be like tomorrow, which is going to be a day, what if you woke up tomorrow morning and said, I'm just going to do something for God today. Right. Well, that's what Jonathan did. Yeah. He had grown tired of everybody sitting on their backside and just watching. Amen. He says, time to do something. Yep. So he got up that day, let's get at it. Yeah. He told his armor bearer. So, it says in verse 4, and between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over under the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And I guess that's between a rock and a hard place. What do you think? Okay. And the name of one was Bozes and the name of the other Sini. Uh, the forefront of the one was situate northward over against Mishmash and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come... And let us go over under the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Now notice what the armor bearer said. Jonathan gets up one morning, and here's his idea. Why don't we just go fight the Philistines? And he's only talking to his armor bearer. So it's two. The armor bearer told him, you don't have to worry about me. You go ahead and do what's in your heart, you don't have to look behind and wonder if I'm there. I'll be there. Amen. You know, it's kind of hard to look ahead when you're wondering if anybody's with you. Yeah. Right. But if there's no doubt, you just keep on going forward, don't you? The armor bearer said, I'm with you. I'm right there. I think what you're saying is crazy. I think it's probably impossible. But I'm with you. Don't worry about it. You go ahead and do whatever it is you want to do. That man was addicted to Jonathan. And the relationship he had with him. And to, and to be his servant. To be the armor bearer for Jonathan. He was not going to be detoured by anything at all. He was going to go forward. Even though he's not named. He said, you can count on me. You don't need to turn around and wonder if I'm there. I'll be right here. Now, interestingly enough, the word garrison <laughs> means a fortified post. So much so that it's guarded with many men fully equipped to defend the post and repel any assault. And Jonathan says, well, let's just go up and fight the garrison. By the way, the more you read your Bible, the more you'll realize that some of the things that God tells us to do don't make sense to us. Matter of fact, we look at them like, well, that's just the craziest thing I've ever heard. Why don't you go down there and march around the city once a day for six days, and on the seventh day march around it for seven times, and then shout? That'll work. Why, why don't I tell you what I'll do? I'll just stand right here and hold a stick up in the air, and we'll just watch the sea part. 
That's why the Bible says in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians, it talks about the foolishness of God. Things of God are not foolish, but they don't make sense to us. But when they marched around Jericho and did what God said, the walls fell. When Moses did what God told him to do, the sea parted. And they walked across on dry land. Now they might, some of them might have been reluctant to do it. And the whole time they were going across, they might have been doing like this. You know, I hope this doesn't cave in on us right away. But they did it. God did that. But you, you'll have to be addicted. You'll have to be devoted if you're going to do those things that God tells you to do that sometimes don't make sense. Don't laugh. Like moving to Kentucky. Didn't make sense. Not to me. Not to, not to begin with. Look down at verse 13 of 1 Samuel 14. Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him, there he is, and they, and they fell before Jonathan. That's talking about the Philistines. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, an half acre of land with a yoke of, that a yoke of oxen might plow. And there was a trembling in the host, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, they all trembled, and the earthquake so that it was a very great trembling. So Jonathan and the armor bearer, two slew twenty. Pretty good odds for the Philistines. But not so when the others are addicted to God. God can do miraculous things through you if you're devoted to Him. Here's a thought to ponder. The actions of the addicted just may be addictive. It might be contagious. You know how I know that? You read the rest of that chapter. You'll find out that when they discovered that Jonathan was gone, and they looked up and they found out what was happening, everybody started getting up and helping even those that were the skeptics, even those that were even the traitors, read this chapter. They joined in. And the Philistines hit the hills, buddy. They gone. And they chased after them. Why? Because one man got up one day and said, I'm going to follow God. And his armor bearer said, I'm addicted to that. I'm coming. I'll help you. I'll be there. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. When you look around and you see somebody, and I, I, probably, I probably believe this is true, that when I've mentioned the, the definition of the word addiction tonight, that you've thought about somebody in this church. There's a good example to follow. Someone that's devoted. Someone that, that is, is all in and, and who wants to do it for God. And, and wants none of the glory. Amen. And you see, you see that. I believe that can be contagious. And he told Timothy, you be an example of the believers. Verse uh, 15 of that same chapter says this, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. They, they, they watch it. They're observing. Yeah. All right, get this. You want to learn how to do it? Watch a church addict. Amen. Observe them. Amen. Observe their attitude. Look at the purpose that they have in their life and, and how they're carrying it out. He said, Timothy, be an example. The armor bearer is an example for us. Let them, that, let them see you as an addict for the ministry. Let them see that you're devoted to God. Give them an, an example what it means to be a true follower. Here's another one of those words that, that we don't define properly anymore. 
uh, because it has a negative con connotation, but here it's, it's uh, uh, very positive. It says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke yes. unto love and to good works. Yes. If I use the word provoke, we, oh, don't, don't do that to me. Don't you provoke me. Right. I'll get back at you. That's not what that means at all. The idea of provoking means to be, be persuasive to guide somebody in a particularly desired direction. And here, the provoking is to love and to good works. That can't be negative. That has to be positive. Yes. Be an example of what it means. And make your, have your testimony, your addiction to the ministry, be such that it provokes others to join in with you. They can see that. Observing. Let me give you one other example. Turn to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, chapter 1. Ruth, chapter 1. <clears throat> the Bible says in chapter 1, verse 12, Ruth, the book of Ruth, Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I'm too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters. For it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and and, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Naomi said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people, and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. You, listen, you, this passage we're about to read, these verses, you can't read this and not get the sense of how devoted Ruth was to Naomi. Right, right. You, I mean, you, can, you can almost read it with a quiver in your voice. Entreat me not to leave thee. Don't, don't, don't send me away or to return from following after thee. But whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Right. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When Naomi saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Ruth let her know, using the biblical term, I'm addicted to this family. I'm addicted to this family. Now, she became a part of it, and even though everything that seemingly could go wrong did go wrong, It didn't change her devotion. It didn't change her dedication or her determination. By the way, if you're addicted to the ministry, a church problem doesn't send you packing. Didn't keep you from going back to Walmart when you didn't like it last week. Just thought I'd throw that in. But it doesn't take too much, it seems like, for people to get mad and pout and go. But truth is, I think they're just labeling themselves. They're not addicted to the ministry. See, if uh, I mean, what else could go wrong here? And Ruth said, I'm still with you. I'm still with you. We're gonna, we're, this going to get worked out. Oh, did it get worked out? Well, I think so. I believe there was a kinsman redeemer. 
named Boaz. And the one who was gleaning in the field ended up owning the field. And married Boaz. And they had a child. (laughs) And that child had a child. And that child had a child. Ruth's devotion, Ruth's addiction, her her devotion, her dedication to the family. We go from being the mother of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, the king of Israel. David's great-grandmother is Ruth. but not if she quit. When she said, even though all of this is going wrong, I'm still with you, I'm still here, and God worked out a miraculous thing where He included a Moabitess into the lineage of Jesus Christ. If you'll read Matthew chapter 1, you'll see that. There's some amazing women in Matthew chapter 1. There's some harlots in Matthew chapter 1. There's some incestuous people in Matthew chapter 1. There's a heathen Moabitess in Matthew chapter 1. And God works out these things. What an example of dedication Ruth shows us. She was addicted to the family of Naomi, and God used that devotion, by the way, to bless us all. Are you addicted to the ministry? I mean, I can break out a point from the Bible, but the challenge is, are are we addicted to the ministry or not? It's showing us that. Uh, you'll not know what kind of positive influence your example will have upon others until you live out that example. Yeah. Amen. I had a, a, a preacher step in chapel one night at the Bible college, and he made this statement, and I never forgot it. And boy, I've used it here recently, I'll tell you that. He said, you never know what steps of faith will do until you take steps of faith. Okay, so I think I'll resign my church and I'll move to Kentucky. Well, I had to do that to see what would happen. You never know what steps of faith will do until you take steps of faith. Let others see Jesus in you. Be the example that others would want to follow and that would bring glory to God. Uh, May our testimony be that uh, that our addiction to the ministry of the saints is something that would be noised abroad. That people would say, hey, that, that's... Boy, they love God there. They're serving God there. May it be found alongside the house of Stephanus. It's not going to be recorded in the Bible. The Bible's through. Yep. But it will be recorded in heaven. And I believe it can be recorded upon the hearts of people that observe it. Oh, so that's what it's supposed to be like. Instead of, that's the way it used to be, it could be that it's still that way in some places. Addicted to the ministry. Are we, are we addicts when it comes to the cause of Christ? Let's all stand, please, if we would. They're having a, a verse of an invitation. If you'd like to get that ready, that'd be fine. Um, you know, I always thought it was an interesting verse when it said, having done all to stand. Ooh, I thought I'd done everything. Oh, no. 
No, there's more to do. An addiction to the ministry brings great glory to God. It reaches out to the world. It makes a difference in your family. It makes a difference, obviously, in your individual life. It makes a difference in your church family. Addiction to the ministry reaches down to the Caribbean islands. Addiction to the ministry is, is and I believe, for it's over with, will reach out even far beyond that. It's amazing what God can do through you. If you'll just let Him. If you just let Him. Lord, tonight we, we thank You for the Word of God. We thank You for the truth that's there. Lord, may our individual lives and the life of this church, this local church, be such that it is noised abroad that we were addicted to the ministry. And in all of that, we know, Lord, that if it's done as it should be, that all the glory goes to you. Lord, I pray that you just have your will and way. Show us. May we see ourselves as you see us. and May we respond to that. And may we be addicts. May we be addicted to the ministry. In our devotion to you. Lord, speak to hearts here tonight as only you can. Of course, in Christ's name we do pray. If you need to come tonight while they're playing. You know. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.